Hello, my name is Cliff Goodwin, and I'm the host of Preaching the Gospel. I'm very grateful that you have tuned in or perhaps even logged on to join me here today. As always, I have my Bible open before me, and I want to begin by stressing the fact that the Word of God, the Bible, is our sole and final authority in all matters pertaining to religion and true spirituality. We need to remember that it is not the opinions or the doctrines or the commandments of men, but only the Word of God by which one day you and I, we will be judged. John 12 and verse 48. How important then that we take opportunities such as this to better acquaint ourselves with the Word of God, gleaning from it in order that we might store it up in our hearts always and also apply it to our lives day by day. We know that the Word is able to save our souls. James chapter 1 and verse 21. Now, I say all of those things by way of preface or introduction here today. The title of our study is pertinent to those thoughts. Our title comes today in the form of a question. What? is sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? Now, in our day and time, there are a variety of approaches and responses to a question such as this. For example, on one extreme, there would be those who would say, look, I'm not even giving doctrine the time of day. Doctrine is unimportant. Uh, Nothing really matters beyond simply believing in Jesus, in his identity, and in his authority, even if they go that far. And so uh, many just reject doctrine altogether. Others, they misunderstand doctrine to include their own opinions and even to include perhaps sanctioned traditions over Uh, years of time, or maybe even over centuries of time. And so the need is pressing for us to ask, but not only to ask, for us also to find the biblical answer to the question, what is sound doctrine? And so I'm so thankful that you're with me, and let's uh, go to the Word of God and begin answering this question. First of all, the word sound uh, needs to be defined. The Greek word that is often translated sound in our Bibles, it is the word that in its primary sense, it meant to be well or to be in good health. When I say in its primary sense, you might be thinking perhaps literally speaking. Sound meant to be well or to be in good health. We can find this usage, for example, in Luke 5 and verse 31. And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole, this is the Greek word for sound, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Now, obviously, Jesus was making a spiritual application of this idea, and yet the idea of Literal sickness, literal wellness was being used to make an analogy or a comparison to a person's spiritual condition. Hence, we see that the word sound or whole meant to be well or to be in good health. Staying in the gospel according to Luke, we could also move to chapter 15 that very common and and very familiar parable of the prodigal son. And in Luke 15 and verse 27, we find this statement. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. Now, in our English translation, we just read three words, safe and sound. But all three of those words are really translated from the one Greek term, commonly put, 
sound or whole. And so those, those words of safe and sound conveyed the idea. The prodigal, having returned home from the foreign land, he has come back and he is now well. It, 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 he's well to be back at home. He has been received safe and sound. And so in its primary or perhaps literal sense, sound meant to be in good health. But how is it used metaphorically? When it's taken now and it's used in connection with doctrine, what's the sense there? Well, Thayer, uh, who is renowned, of course, as a Greek scholar and lexicographer, he said of the word sound, Used of one whose Christian opinions, I think uh, I and, and many of you would probably say beliefs, one whose Christian opinions or one whose beliefs are free from any admixture of error. When I saw that statement from Thayer, I was intrigued by that. That's, that's accurate. That's biblically accurate. But it's also very uh, restraining and very confining, which makes it biblically accurate. One whose opinions or beliefs are free from any admixture of error. And so when we speak of soundness with regard to doctrine, what we are acknowledging is we are acknowledging there is truth. It is absolute and knowable truth. And we're acknowledging that there is also error. And thus, a person is sound, or his doctrine or his manner of life is sound, when it is free from any admixture of error. Again, that's from Thayer, and I thought that was very, very telling. Now, Strong, who also is well-known as a Greek scholar, He said of this word sound or whole that metaphorically, when it's used in a figurative sense, it means to be uncorrupt, that is, to be true in doctrine. And so it's really easy, relatively easy for us to wrap our minds around. Soundness in a physical, literal sense means wellness. It means good health. But when we move it over into a spiritual sense, it means to be true. It means to be free from error. It means to be uncorrupt. Now, that word sound, of course, is connected to the word doctrine. And so that word also merits our attention, at least for a brief moment. The word doctrine, as we find it in our uh, Bibles, particularly in our New Testament, The word doctrine simply means teaching, teaching, and it especially often refers to a body of teaching or a deposit, if you will, a deposit of truth, a body of teaching that is taught. Now, if a man is teaching the truth as revealed from God and contained in the Scriptures, He's obviously practicing sound, or he's giving sound doctrine, sound teaching. But if a man deviates in any way, he departs from what the Bible teaches, well, then his teaching, his doctrine, is no longer sound. It's no longer healthy and life-giving. Now, I know very quickly there we went through those two terms, sound and doctrine. But let's move on, and we're going to start incorporating a number of passages into our study as we now answer our question at hand. What is sound doctrine? And I would like today to answer this really primarily from the negative. We as human beings, we learn by way of contrast. And so I want to identify, at least in a couple of instances, I want to identify what sound doctrine is not. And having learned that, then hopefully you and I are in a better place 
to appreciate and understand what sound doctrine is. Number one, sound doctrine is not limited only to teaching accurately concerning the nature of Christ. Now, that's a mouthful, so I'll repeat it. But sound doctrine is not limited only to teaching accurately concerning the nature of Christ. There are many people in the world today, and and sadly some, even within Christ's church, who have adopted this viewpoint. I want to refer you to the text at hand. The text under consideration at this point is found in 2 John. In 2 John, if you'll read with me, beginning at verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Now, it's obvious from reading these three verses in the book of Second John that the doctrine of Christ is of utmost importance. Uh, For example, in verse 9, one who goes beyond that, one who uh, reaches beyond the parameters or the limits of the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He has forfeited fellowship with both the Father and the Son, verse 9. Then in verse 10, uh, John warns that if there are false teachers who are bringing any other doctrine other than the doctrine of Christ, We are not to aid or abet them in any way, neither by lodging them in our homes in order to support them and further them on their journeys, nor even by pronouncing God's blessing upon them, bidding them Godspeed. And then thirdly, in verse 11, John goes on to say, look, if you do this, you become complicit in their error and now you're a partaker of their evil deeds, verse 11. So it goes without saying from Second John that the doctrine of Christ is paramount. It's of utmost importance. Now, here's the rub, or here's the problem, if you will. Increasing numbers of people today seem to be saying that the doctrine or the teaching of Christ is more accurately understood as simply the teaching about Christ, the nature of Christ particularly. And they draw this from the context of 2 John, which I will admit. In the book of 2 John, John does address the nature and the identity of Christ, and that too is absolutely paramount. If we miss the nature, the identity of Christ, then then we're lost. We're in our our sins. But it's not only the identity of Christ that is of paramount importance. It's also the authority of Christ that is likewise important. See, because Christ is deity come in the flesh, because Christ has died on the cross and been buried and has been resurrected victoriously, He has been given all authority, Matthew 28 and verse 18. And from his own lips, Jesus said there, as recorded in Matthew 28, that the apostles initially, and by extension, I believe, believers still today, we are to go forth and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, but also teaching them to observe all things whatsoever he has commanded. Now, if the doctrine of Christ as read in 2 John is limited only to the teaching about Christ, the teaching concerning his nature and identity, well, then Matthew 28, 18 through 20 really become void. 
those verses become void and empty of any real meaning. The authority of Christ really becomes a moot point. If we only need to understand his identity and believe that, then what of his authority? We really need not submit to his will. We really need not obey his teachings. And yet that is contrary to everything we find in the New Testament. Uh, It's summarized very simply by our Lord's own words, once again, much like we found in Matthew 28. This time they come to us from Luke chapter 6. In Luke 6 and verse 46, Jesus himself asked, And why calleth me, or why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And so really these two concepts, they go together. The doctrine of Christ, as we read it in 2 John, uh, for example, yes, it involves the teaching about Christ, his identity and his uh, nature, absolutely. But the doctrine of Christ obviously, obviously also includes the teachings from Christ, the doctrine that he has given. Now, to further show and demonstrate that, Let's stay with the same inspired penman, the Apostle John, right? He wrote the book of 2 John, but he also wrote the gospel according to John. Compare what we read in 2 John verses 9 through 11 with what we read now in the gospel according to John chapter 14, verses 23 and 24. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. Would those not be the teachings of Christ, the doctrine of Christ? Absolutely. And my Father will love him, and we, Jesus with his Father, will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now that's striking. Because in 2 John, the same writer, John the Apostle, will write about having both the Father and the Son if we abide in the doctrine of Christ. And so the the imagery here is, is very, very similar. Verse 24 of John 14, He that loveth me, Christ, or he that loveth me not, rather, keepeth not my sayings. And so If we do reject the teachings from Christ, then we don't love Christ. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine alone, but the Father's which sent me. And so again in verse 24, Jesus and the Father are linked together, and man's keeping the sayings of Christ is is given in connection to both Christ and the Father, much like what we find in 2 John verse 9. And so it goes without saying, I think, without any further argument, really. Sound doctrine is not merely or only teaching accurately regarding the nature of Christ. Now, it involves that, and and really that's foundational. It's because of who he is that what he teaches is important. And so we abide in both. We abide in the proper teaching concerning his identity, but we also abide in the proper teaching concerning his authority and his directives in life. The doctrine of Christ involves all of those things. All of those are important. Now, let's move on to a second point. Number two, sound doctrine is not, it is not pluralism or relativism. Now, those might be terms that you don't use perhaps every day. I typically do not use those terms every day myself. But by mentioning pluralism or relativism, they're technically different, I suppose, but they often go together, as it were, hand in hand. Pluralism denotes the idea that 
there are more ways to be right than just one way. Pluralism. We know the meaning of plural. And so when it comes to spiritual matters, pluralism would allege that truth is not exclusive. Truth is not unique and solitary, but rather there are more than, there are many ways to be right with God. Pluralism. Now, I know that's a very simplistic and it's not a technical definition, but for our working purposes here today, I think that will suffice. Now, relativism, also in a very layman's uh, uh, type description, relativism is saying that there is no absolute truth. You know, not only is there not a unique and, and solitary truth, but there's not even absolute truth. Truth is relative to the individual and is relative to his or her life experiences and, and his or her whatever, interpretation or whatever they might say. Truth is, is not absolute. In other words, what's right for Cliff Goodwin and what's true for me is not necessarily right and true for you. Well, the Bible does not teach either of these. And so our second point by way of contrast Sound doctrine is not pluralism or relativism. But let's look to the book of Ephesians. Look with me in chapter 4. In Ephesians 4 and verse 14, notice what Paul did not want for the Ephesian Christians. He said that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You know, if we yield ourselves to pluralism and relativism, well, then there really is no end. There is no end to uh, the directions in which we might be swept and tossed and turned by the various and sundry and often even contradictory doctrines of men. Now, the only way to avoid that kind of spiritual fate is to realize that God has given us objective, absolute truth. And that sound doctrine requires that we come together on the teachings of Christ as found in the Bible. Consider 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now just step back from that verse and let's ask ourselves honestly, is there any room for relativism or pluralism? When the Holy Spirit through Paul commands us that we speak the same thing, that there be no divisions, no divisions among us, but that we be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment? Absolutely no room for pluralism or relativism. In John chapter 17, another passage for us to consider Jesus was praying to the Father just hours before his arrest and subsequent trials and ultimately his crucifixion. And so many things we could imagine might have been on the mind of Jesus at this crisis point in his life and in his ministry. And yet in his prayer to the Father, he said this in verses 20 and 21. He said, Neither pray I for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now, in that context, the them would be the apostles particularly. But he says, I'm not only, Father, praying for my chosen apostles. I'm also praying for them which shall believe on me through their word. Now, I have opened before me the apostolic word. I have the New Testament. 
uh, written either by apostles or by those who uh, were in contact with the apostles. Those in the first century inspired apostles and prophets of the New Testament. And, and I believe on Jesus Christ as a result of what I've read in their word. Now, that means that Jesus prayed for me right here. And, and if you're viewing today and you believe on Jesus Christ because of what you find in the New Testament, well, then Jesus prayed for you. But this is what he prayed for all of us. Verse 21, that they all may be one, not variegated, not divided, but that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. We look out into our world of modern times and we see secularism on a steep rise. So much secularism, so many people turning away from the Bible, turning away from spirituality, turning away from Christianity. And no doubt this is part of the problem, if not the, the biggest part of the problem, that so-called professing Christians are so diverse in their doctrine. They are so varied in their teachings. They are not unified, but rather divided. What is sound doctrine? It is not relativism. It is not pluralism. As we close, sound doctrine is simply the teaching of God's Word, the faithful teaching of God's Word as it addresses the needs and the responsibilities of man. I'll close with this. It's uh, Matthew 4 and verse 4. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What the Bible teaches is sound doctrine. Thank you. Thank you for being with me today as we discuss sound doctrine, its meaning, and its importance. As we close, I would like to briefly go over with you sound doctrine regarding the question, what must I do to be saved? According to biblical teaching, one must believe on Jesus Christ. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, Mark 16, 16. One must repent, turning away from sins, but one also must make the good confession. We must confess that Jesus is Lord, the Son of God. But then one must be baptized, immersed in water, for the remission of one's sins. We see this in Acts 22 and verse 16. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friends, according to the scriptures, that is sound doctrine.